Tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Of course, none of us are greedy. It's only the other fellow who's greedy. <laughs> this, the world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from a, from a, a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of grinding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history are where they, where they have had capitalism and largely free trade. If you want to know where the masses are worth, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear that there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by a free enterprise system. But it's the only way in which you can redistribute effectively the wealth is by destroying the incentives to have wealth. And the question is, what is the way, what is the system which will offer those people who are so unlucky as to be born without uh, good positions, what is the system which will offer them the greatest opportunity? Well, one possible way of redistributing the wealth without affecting the incentives to earn as much income as possible is simply to have a 100% inheritance tax. Uh, but Since that, that won't not, affect the incentives, it's only after the person is dead your, anyway. I beg your pardon. Uh, you're too, uh, I'm afraid, uh, uh, I don't know the family you come from. <laughs> I don't, uh, but as you grow up, you will discover that this is really a family society and not an individual society. We tend to talk about an individualist society, but it really isn't. It's a family society. And the greatest incentives of all, the incentives that have really driven people on, have largely been the incentives of family creation, a family of pursuing, of establishing their families on a decent system. What is the effect of 100% inheritance tax? The percent of a 100% inheritance tax is to encourage people to dissipate their wealth in high living. What's the harm in that? It. The harm in that is that where do you get the factories? Where do you get the machines? Where do you get the capital investment? Where do you get the incentive to improve technology? If what you're doing is to establish a society in which the incentive is for people who, if they by accident accumulate some wealth, to waste it in frivolous entertainment, you know, the thing is that the thing that is amazing that people don't really recognize is the extent to which the market system has, in fact, encouraged people and enabled people to work hard and sacrifice in what I must confess I often regard as an irrational way for the benefit of their children. One of the most curious things to me in observation is that almost all people value the utility which their children will get from consumption higher than they value their own. Here are parents who have every reason to expect that their children will have a higher income than they ever had. And they scrimp and save in order to be able to leave something for their children. I think you are sort of like a bull in a china shop if you talk about the 100% inheritance tax having no incentive effects. It would destroy a continuing society it would destroy a society. First of all, the government doesn't have any responsibility. People have responsibility. This building doesn't have responsibility. You and I have responsibility. People have responsibility. Second, the question is how can we as people exercise our responsibility toward our fellow man most effectively? That's the problem. So far as poverty is concerned, there is never in history been a more effective machine for eliminating poverty than the free enterprise system and the free market. The period in... <laughs> the period in which you had the greatest improvement in the lot of the ordinary man was the period of the 19th and early 20th century. Those of us in this room are the heirs of that. We benefited from the way in which our parents and our grandparents were able to come here. And by virtue of the freedom that was offered to them, we're able to make a better life for themselves and our, uh, them and us. But next, if you look at the real problems of poverty and denial of freedom to people in this country, 
Almost every single one of them is a result of government action and would be eliminated if you eliminated the bad government failures. Let me be precise and specific. Why do we have so high an unemployment rate among black teenagers? It's a disgrace and a scandal. Why do we have so high an unemployment rate? First of all, because we give them lousy schooling through governmental schools, which make them unqualified to hold decent jobs. And second of all, we require employers to discriminate against them by not hiring them unless, they have, uh, unless their productivity is enough to justify a minimum wage. The minimum wage rate is the most anti-Negro law in the books. And it's an anti-Negro law because it precisely, having first not, not enabled the young blacks to have a decent schooling so that they can, they can have productivity, we next deny them the on-the-job training that they might get if you could induce employers by, a low, by being able to hire them for relatively low wages to give them on-the-job training that would make them qualify for higher payment and higher productivity. In the third place, we have constructed a governmental welfare scheme which has been a machine for producing poor people. We have induced people to come under control of welfare. We've, I'm not blaming the people. Don't misunderstand me. It's our fault for constructing so perverse and so ill-shaped a monster as the whole set of welfare programs we have under which we encourage people, uh, families to break up. We encourage people to move from one part of the country and come to another, under which we have, in effect, made many people poor. And yet, when all this is said and done, have I ever been where? Welfare, or poor, without I have certain, of course, of course, more so than most of the people in this room. How many of you have worked a 12-hour day and gotten paid 78 cents? <laughs> but let me go back to the, because, but you know that's all, all irrelevant. Is there one of you who is going to say that you don't want a doctor to treat you for cancer unless he himself has had cancer? <laughs> I could go down the line. But when all is said and done, while there are people in this country who are worse off than other people, by and large, the well, uh, the, even the poorest people in this country are relatively well off compared to the conditions in many other countries in the world. What we take as our standard of poverty, what we take as our standard of poverty, is above the average income of all of the people in the Soviet Union, let alone of the people in India or China or in other countries. Now that doesn't mean we should be satisfied with it. We are a wealthier country and we've been more productive. And we should set higher standards by ourselves. But by the same token, we ought to have a sense of proportion. And we ought to recognize both the source and the problem. Equal pay for equal work laws are a source of apartheid. You know, the basic source of apartheid in South Africa was the insistence by trade unions on equal pay for equal work. The, equal, the women who go around today urging equal pay for equal work are being anti-feminist. They don't intend to be, but that is the effect of their policy. Because if there is any activity in which for any reason a male is preferable to a female, or vice versa, the only weapon, the less productive sex has is to offer to work for less. And if you deny them that opportunity, you're assuring yourself that you're going to have all male jobs or all female jobs, all white jobs or all black jobs. But aren't you also condemning them to stay that way? Not at all. Not at all. The typical course, if you go back to American history, by taking these low-paid jobs, a great many people, not all, but a great many people were able to develop skills and activities, accumulate a little skill, a little capital, a little knowledge, improve their lot, become a, a advance in the stage, get to a higher level of productivity, and get a higher income. That's been the typical way up the ladder for most of the people who came in here. It was a way up the ladder for my parents, for your 
parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, I don't know which. And that's the way in which, unfortunately, there's no way in which you can si immediately basis. propel people to the top of the ladder. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Friedman, referring to the statements that you made about women who advocate equal pay for equal work. <laughs> Gee, I thought I'd get a rise out of that sooner or later. <laughs> Delighted to have it. Um, Yes, okay, I just would like to know if you're insinuating or perhaps, you know, point blankly saying that um, women and other minorities' skills are inferior to those of those now holding those jobs and that they need to go through a period where their skills need to be improved and therefore deserve to be paid less? No, I don't think dessert has anything to do with it. I'm not, for, first of all, I think dessert is an impossible thing to decide. Who deserves what? Nobody deserves anything. Thank God we don't get what we deserve. <laughs> but, but I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying a very different thing. I'm saying that the actual effect of requiring equal pay for equal work will be to harm women. If women's skills are higher than men's in a particular job and are recognized to be higher, the law does no good. Because then they will be able to compete away and can get the same income. If their skills are less for whatever reason, maybe it isn't because they're it's their sex, maybe it's because they were out of the labor force, maybe it's for other reasons. And you say the only way you, can, you are able to hire them is by paying the same wage, then you're denying them the only weapon they have to fight with. If the unwillingness of the men to hire them is because the men are sexist, uh, are, 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 what's the phrase, racist, uh, sexist pigs or whatever, <laughs> if that's the only reason they want to hire them, nonetheless. You want to make it costly to them to exercise their prejudice. If you say to them, hmm, you have to pay the same wage no matter whether you pay higher women or men, then here's Mr. Sexist Pig. It doesn't cost him anything to hire men instead of women. However, if the women are free to compete and to say, well, now look, I'll offer my work for less, then he can only hire men if he bears a cost. If the women are really good as a man, as good as a man, then he's paying a price for discriminating. And what you are doing, not intentionally, but by misunderstanding, when you try to get equal pay for equal work laws, is what you are doing is reducing to zero the cost imposed on people who are, who are discriminating for irrelevant reasons. And I would like to see a cost imposed on them. I'm on your side, but you're not. 